Would you join me in prayer this morning? Loving God, we have a challenging text today to open our minds and our hearts that we can learn and grow from these words in Luke's gospel. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, earlier this month, about three weeks ago, I had the chance to uh, join with some other Woodmont members and uh, go and attend a film premiere downtown at the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, for a movie called The Ultimate Life. And this movie is uh, based on a book written by Jim Stovall. Uh, and before he wrote The Ultimate Life, he wrote a book uh, probably 15 years ago or so called The Ultimate Gift. And this uh, book was the sequel, and they actually made a movie out of both of these books. But The Ultimate Life basically tells the story, the life story of billionaire Red Stevens. He grew up in a, a poor family in Depression-era Louisiana, a family that could barely make ends meet. His father told him that he would never be rich, but he made the decision early on that he would one day become a billionaire and break the cycle of poverty of his family. Inspired by the success and the wealth of Andrew Carnegie back in that day, uh, he runs away from home, he hops on a train, and he finds himself in Texas, in Tyler, Texas. And the first job that he gets is uh, a job building fences for a wealthy rancher who also becomes his mentor. He falls in love, he later goes off and fights in World War II, and then when he returns to Texas from the war, he gets married, and he goes to work in the oil business. And the movie tells the story about his climb to success. Uh, he works hard, he works long hours, and he strikes it rich in the oil industry. And over time, Red Stevens achieves his lifelong goal of becoming a billionaire. However, in the process of doing this, a lot of other things happen to him. He neglects his marriage and his family. He doesn't spend time with his children and they become very spoiled and entitled. He makes a lot of enemies along the way because of his ruthless cutthroat business practices. And all of this comes to head one Christmas when he and his lawyer are up in the panhandle up by Amarillo uh, trying to close a deal on an oil refinery. And that uh, is a deal that will actually make him a billionaire, his lifelong dream. But he's away from his family on Christmas Day. And his lawyer tells him, Red, I'm going to go back and be with my family because it's Christmas. And so he flies back. And the lawyer, who is really his only friend because he works all the time and he spends all of his time with him, the lawyer is in a bad car accident that puts him in a coma and he needs a kidney in order to survive. Well, upon hearing this news, Red flies back home and he goes to see his friend in the hospital. And he has an epiphany on Christmas. His blood type matches that of his lawyer's. And so he decides to donate his kidney, and he also decides to make some other changes in his life. He spends more time with his wife. He sets up a family foundation to give back to charities. And fortunately for Red Stevens, he's able to do these things before it's too late. And this is a great movie. It's in the theaters right now. I'd highly recommend that you go uh, and see it. It's not a high dollar film, so it's not in all the theaters, but it's in some theaters here in Nashville. But what was interesting when we went to the premiere of this film down at the Country Music Hall of Fame is that the cast was there, and the actor who plays Red in his adult years, Drew Waters, talked to us about how it was very easy for him to play this role because he had once lived that life. In the talkback session, he told us how when he was young and, and Starting off in his career, he was solely focused and dedicated to uh, success and climbing that ladder and trying to earn as much money as he possibly could. But later, he changed his career path and he became an actor because that was his passion. And so when he was asked to play this role, 
it was a natural fit for him. But the movie is a great reminder of what can happen in life if you neglect the things that are most important to you. If you neglect the things like your, your family and your marriage and your friendships and philanthropy and compassion and giving back. And unfortunately, we all know that that happens far too often in our culture. People get so focused on money and careers and success and power and prestige that they seem to forget what matters most in life. What does the ultimate life look like for you? Are you living it right now? Is it falling in love? Is it getting to retire early? And what is early? Is it time spent with your wife or your husband and with family? Time spent with children or with grandchildren? Is it a long and healthy and happy marriage? Is it a life that's full of compassion and philanthropy? Is it living in a certain place, the mountains, the beach, somewhere else? What does it look like for you? As we continue to make our way through Luke's gospel this fall, we find ourselves looking at a series of scriptures that have to deal with the topic of money. And it's not even stewardship season. We do that in the spring. People get tired of preachers talking about money because they think that all the preachers are doing is asking for money for the church, which might be true to some degree, but that's not totally true. You see, Jesus talked about money a lot. And so what I can say is, don't shoot the messenger. I'm articulating the scriptures that we have for this morning. Jesus talked about money because he knew that it was universal. He knew that it was relevant to everybody. And he knew that it was always and would always be very complicated. Jesus also knew that when he talked about money, that that opened up the door to talk about things like greed and selfishness and generosity and motive and compassion and priorities. And so today we have this story in Luke 16 of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus tells us about a man who dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate, there was a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who ate the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Now, this is one of the few times in scripture where we actually have the text giving us the name of the beggar, Lazarus. Usually in the Bible, we don't have the name of those that are, uh, that are begging on the street. But Lazarus dies, and then all of a sudden, this story shifts to heaven. And Jesus tells us that Lazarus is in heaven with Abraham and the rich man is in Hades being tormented and he begs Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. But Abraham says, child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Like so many of Jesus' other teachings, this is difficult. This is challenging. What is he trying to say? Well, we can state the obvious. In life, there are different classes of people. Everybody knows that. There's the upper class. There's the upper middle class. There's the middle class. There's the lower middle class. There's the lower class. And then there are those who live in poverty. And there's statistics that back this up, right? But what is the message here? Is Jesus trying to say that the poor and the beggars get to heaven and the rich don't? Is he saying that those who live a life of luxury in this world will not in the world to come? Or could he be simply saying that if there are those in need right before our very eyes, and we acknowledge them, but we never do anything about it, that's a problem. And there could be repercussions for that. 
Last week we were looking at the parable of the dishonest manager in Luke 16, and I threw out the possibility that this life could be our trial run, that the way that we treat other people in this world might lay the foundation for the way that we are going to be treated in the world to come. I don't know. That's simply speculation on my part, but I would not rule it out, especially in light of scriptures like the one we have this morning. I'm reminded of a story that's told about a lady who lived in a luxurious mansion in a swanky neighborhood. We won't mention any neighborhoods, but it's some other town other than Nashville, right? And one day when she dies and she goes to heaven, St. Peter welcomes her to the pearly gates and said, follow me, I'm going to show you to your new house. And so they walked into a neighborhood with some huge mansions, beautiful houses, and the lady thought, well, this is great. Uh, this is just looks like just what I left. I can, I can live here. But St. Peter keeps walking. They get to a more modest neighborhood, some ranch-style houses. Not bad, but not what she was expecting. And she said, well, th- this, this is okay, but uh, I, guess it'll, I guess it'll do. Uh, I, can make, I can make do with this. Well, St. Peter keeps walking, and they get to a much poorer neighborhood with some very small houses, and they come up to this one tiny shack that looks like it's about to fall down, and St. Peter stops. And she says, surely this isn't where I'm going to live. I mean, you know where I lived before. How can I live in this place? And St. Peter said, well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but that's all we could have afforded with what you sent ahead. You see, Jesus was the one who said the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus was the one who gave us these difficult teachings about money and possessions and try as we might, we cannot ignore them. And Jesus is the one who is challenging us to think about our loyalties in life and to think about the things that we are committed to. As I think about this allegory in Luke 16, and that's what this is, this is an allegory, it's not necessarily a parable. I find myself reflecting upon the question, what is it that defines us in life? What is life all about? What does the ultimate life look like and feel like for us? Are we defined by our job or our career? Are we defined by our friends and our social circles? Are we defined by our family of origin or the family into which we marry? Are we defined by where our children go to school? Or are we defined by our faith and by the way that we treat other people? And I can tell you the answer to this question, what defines us, is going to be different for every single person here this morning. But the answer to the question should have nothing to do with possession. It should have everything to do with character, compassion, love, and the ongoing recognition that there are people like Lazarus who are all around us in our community. And when it comes to charity and to outreach, there are two different mindsets that we can have. We can be involved in charity because it makes us feel good about ourselves and so other people will will recognize us for doing it or we can get involved in charity because we understand the fact that people are suffering and they are in dire need Nashville is a very philanthropic town I don't have to tell you all that Uh, there are more nonprofits in this town than we can even begin uh, to name and there are galas and auctions and fundraisers all of the time And I see some of you at those things. But again, I will remind you that there is a difference between doing charity because it is fashionable and because it makes you look good and doing charity because you understand the needs of those whom we help and you understand Christ's call to serve the least of these. I want to propose something here this morning at Woodmont for this fall. For over 70 years now, our church has always been known as a church that is committed to mission and outreach. We just celebrated our 70th birthday this summer. And we have people in this congregation that inspire me each and every day because of their willingness to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. They serve 
and they give back. Just think about some of the things that we do here on this campus and at this church. We house a national food project to help feed the working poor and the homeless of our community. We have room in the inn during the winter months, habitat builds in the spring, mobile mills, tools for schools, homeless lunches, AA on Tuesday and Thursday nights, divorce care on Wednesday nights. We send groups to the Morgan Scott Project uh, a few times a year to help those who live in poverty up in that area in East Tennessee. We sponsor uh, numerous children in Guatemala. I think I heard that it's over 60 kids that are sponsored in Guatemala by members of Woodmont Christian Church. We have mission trips that go to Africa, Swaziland, Haiti, and Guatemala. We give outreach grants to, to numerous organizations. The money that you give to this church does not just stay here. It goes back out into the community. And most of you know all of this. But I want to propose this fall that we recommit ourselves to all of these things that we do and that we gain a clear understanding of why we do these things as individuals and as a church. We don't do these things just to make ourselves feel good, but to live out the words of Jesus in Matthew 25 when he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you gave me clothing. Sick and in prison and you visited me. This is why we do it. Jesus said, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Room in the Inn will start back up in about a month or so. And Selena Guilfoy and Mary Kiger will tell you that we need a committee to help host this very important ministry. And we need people that are willing to be overnight hosts that will stay up at South Hall with our guests on Friday nights. Because that seems to be the area where we lack volunteers. There's another mission trip coming up to Morgan Scott. The LaForges are going to go. The Whedon Wrights are going to go. John Carpenter is always looking for people to go and uh, volunteer for tools for schools over at Hillsborough to help build uh, desks and furniture for the inner city schools that are often underfunded uh, to help these kids in their formative years. I want us to recommit ourselves to doing the things in this community and beyond the things that Christ is calling us to do and to recognize why we do it. But I don't want us to stop there. I want us to think about the future and what this church will look like in the future. We know, for example, that South Hall, which is the little house we own up on the hill where we do a lot of these ministries, we know that it's overcrowded. Tulu called me this week and said we're about to hire some new staff and we have nowhere to put them for the National Food Project. We know that we simply cannot even sustain the ministries that we have up there right now with that space. And so we've put together a strategic planning committee to look at this and to explore this and to get feedback from the congregation so that we can deal with this. But I want us to not just commit ourselves to the ministries that we're doing now, but to commit ourselves to doing these ministries in the years to come so that we can make sure that mission and outreach remains a top priority here at Woodmont Christian Church. And what that means is we have to grow awareness. We have to grow the number of volunteers in each of these different areas. It means pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone, rearranging our schedules. It means not just sitting back and assuming that somebody else will go and do it. It means taking the initiative to serve the people who, like Lazarus in our text this morning, are hurting, hungry, lonely, and lost. That's what it means to live out the gospel. That's what this text today is all about. And remember, we don't do it just to make ourselves feel good. We do it because there is great need and because it's what Christ has commanded us to do. Selfishness and self-centeredness, comfort and complacency are some of the greatest challenges 
of our age. And if we take our faith seriously, then Christ has given us a timeless recipe to deal with it. Mission and compassion. But we have to do it, and then we have to keep doing it. Growing up as the, the son of a minister, I, I've heard my dad many times talk about the cross. And we all know what the cross symbolizes, but have you ever thought about the fact that the vertical bar of the cross symbolizes our relationship with God? And that includes things like worship and Bible study and spiritual growth and prayer and meditation. But the horizontal bar of the cross represents our relationship to other people and our call to serve and to help other people in life. Without both bars, you don't have the cross. And without both aspects of Christianity, you don't have a complete faith. There are lots of churches that are really good at the vertical bar. And there are lots of churches that are really good at the horizontal bar. But I hope that all of us will be good at both. And that those two things will go hand in hand as we look to the future. Let me close this morning with the words of John Wesley, who is regarded as the founder of the Methodist Church. He once said, do all the good that you can, by all the means that you can, in all the ways that you can, in all the places that you can, at all the times that you can, to all the people that you can, for as long as you ever can. Amen.